Today we're doing lecture 32. We're picking up where we left off last time in transportation planning. And today we're going to look at trip distribution and using two different systems, the logit and the gravity model uh, for both of those systems. So the trip distribution, the, the big piece is where, where do people come from? Where are they going? What zone do they come out of? And what zone are they going to? And how many people are uh, going or coming from zones is trip generation. That's what we've been discussing previously was based on, you know, zone number one. It may have, you know, 1,000 single family homes within it and, you know, 1.5 people per average per home or, or whatever the population at the last census told you was in that zone. And that's somewhat how we get our, our generation. Then we, we work on that and say, well, we know that a, uh, a single family home with two cars and three people living there on average make, you know, 1.7 shopping trips and 1.5 work trips and, you know, whatever else number of trips per day. Or maybe we look at it in the peak hour, they make how many trips during the peak hours. We can break it down even smaller, right? So that's trip generation. And so now we know in this zone, there are so many trips being generated, right? That's exactly what it sounds like. That's how many, um, how many trips will be coming out of that place. Right. And then the second question is, where are they going? And right. that's what we really want to know. Um, we're eventually we want to get to the point where we can assign travelers to routes and or modes through um, through our system, right? So it's either car modes or bus modes or whatever. Um, that's where we want to end up. Now the book is uh, <laughs> unabashedly focused on roads, and so they're looking at maybe bus traffic, but mostly it's all uh, personal vehicles. What they're looking at, and yet that's a simplification that makes it easier. I'll just know that in a in a bigger model, you're going to try to model as many modes as you can, uh, any that have any significant traffic on them. All right. So that's what trip trip distribution is all about. Is where are are we starting from, and where are we going to? Right. And we look at, we call them origin and destination zones, right? So makes sense. We, your origin is probably where you live and your destination is where you're going. Now, uh, work-based trips, the origin's a home and the destination is work, right? There's not a lot of dis dispute about that. Um, in the final steps where we look at route choice or mode choice, there's a little more dispute into that uh, through there. But it's, it's probably like you coming to campus, you're going to make almost always the same choices, um, both on route and uh, how you're going to get there. And maybe it varies a little more than I think it does, but uh, let's say you live two miles away, you're probably just going to drive to campus, especially if you already have, uh, if you've already paid for a commuter pass, right, uh, for parking. So uh, there's probably not a lot of variance in that uh, through, uh, but we still want to know for people living in whichever zone, where they're going to go, and then we'll, we'll try to pick out which next, the next steps are, uh, are you going to walk or ride your bike or drive a car? And what route would you take if you did one of those things right, through that? And we, we look at these trips um, by purpose, right? So a shopping trip is we know how many shopping trips are being generated in zone one. We know how many um, uh, recreation and other trips are generated in zone one, how many work trips are generated in zone one. And then what zones are they going to, right? It's not going to be matched up. Right. There are some zones that have a heavy commercial presence, a lot of stores. You're much, much more likely you're going to go shopping into a zone that has a lot of shopping versus a zone that may only have two shops in it. Right. Yeah. Occasionally you may go to the other zone that has two shops if that's one of the shops you really like. Right. Maybe it's a pet store, but you only have to go to the pet store so often. Right. Once a month or, or, or whatever. Uh, if you, every time your dog needs a new toy, you're going to go to the pet store. Otherwise, you probably won't be going there. You'll be going to the shopping center, right? So by Silhavy and Laporte, that's a huge shopping area right along there. You've got the Target and the Menards and, and everything else there. It's more likely you're going to go there if you're going to go shopping than it is if you're going to go um, to one of the regions north of town, which is almost all residential. All right, so so that's this that's this trip purpose piece. That's one of the ways we're going to split this up is by trip purpose, right? So our textbook combines mode choice with trip distribution. And at the end of the chapter, this is chapter eight, at the end of the chapter, they do talk about, well, 
Um, even though we've combined it and we're using the logit model, that's not how most models are. Well, that is correct. <laughs> this is uh, it's a, <laughs> their logit system and, and combining it, it makes sense, but it's not the most used uh, system yet. Maybe it's catching on more as time goes on, but so far most models that I know of, and I'm not an expert in this, but most models aren't using the combined uh, choice, right? So, and you can see their their idea is, well, if I'm leaving zone one to go to zone three to go shopping, right? Um, what zone I'm going to and what mode I get there is a has a combined utility, right? So if I'm going to go to the next uh, zone over, you know, maybe it's only a few blocks away, you know, walking there is a much higher utility uh, than walking, you know, five miles away, right? So you can kind of see how they're, they are connected and they can be connected in uh, some of these newer models, right? The classic method, the four-step method splits them in, in pieces first. It says, first of all, where do you want to go? And then, you know, what mode are you going to choose is our next step after that. Yes, you can combine them. It is not uh, the most common system in the models. Well, maybe the models I know of are more <laughs> bigger traditional ones through that. Uh, but we can use it. So we're going to talk about those. Just, just a, a heads up that in, if you're reading through the book, they are combining the mode choice uh, with uh, trip distribution. The classic models split those into two pieces. You can see how they're kind of related and can, could, be, could be connected, but they, they aren't always. Uh, through there. So and we're going to start back for our TADS, right, our uh, uh, transportation analysis zones. And then we split those up then by purpose. And so work trips, shopping trips, and so forth, right, through there. And then in the classic system in the trip distribution, we also then look at how hard it is to go from one place to another. We call that impedance. And um, some of it's distance. Some of it is how much time it takes, right? Um some zones may be closer to you, but the traffic is snarled up so bad to get there. Uh, it's always congested that the actual travel time is longer, and then there's frustration involved. Um, so that would be part of this impedance uh, factor that we look at. Cost is a part of it, right? So if you're going to go to Chicago, you can drive your car. We well, you already own the car, and you may not think there is much cost, but there is. There's some mileage cost versus taking a train in, right? It's $9.40 or whatever it is to ride to South Shore in, into Chicago. Um, is it? And But it takes longer, you know, well... Most days, it takes longer to, to ride the train. So that's this balance, right? So that's this impedance. And this impedance factor, we take all those things into account. So it may take me 45 minutes longer to ride the train in, but uh, and cost me $9.40, but it cost me something to drive the car, then I have to pay for parking, and then I got the hassle factor of I don't like traffic that well, and I'm not quite sure where I'm going, whereas the train just drops me off down at Millennium Station and I'm done, right? So that all of that would be boiled down into an impedance factor uh, through there. So it's going to uh, hopefully... Uh, be holistic and, and include all the costs and uh, frustration, maybe you'd call it, uh, in whatever your choices are and where you're going. All right. So then we're going to use this impedance. Then we're going to create these trip tables between uh, production zones and attraction zones, right? Origin, destination, production, attraction. And that's how we, uh, terms we talk about like, with travel demand modeling, right? Where you live is a production zone. You're yeah, um, people are a, a product, I guess. Uh, you're producing a trip. That's what we're looking at really is trips. Where are trips produced? Um, typically, they're produced in residential areas largely. Now, also at lunch, right, um, trips are produced in workplaces because people go out for lunch and where they're going to drive. And where, are they get, where is the attraction zone? Well, it depends on what your trip purpose is. All right, through there. So then we do these tables then based on trip uh, purposes. So here's an example, right? If we had, if we had this zone out here, uh, and we wanted to come down here by campus, right? So what's the uh, what's the likelihood of people who live in this rural kind of sparsely inhabited area, more sparsely, uh, out here, larger lots, you can see where the subdivision roads are, right? It looks kind of big. It's not dense like the downtown environment. And if they were coming over here to campus, right, how many people would be going between the, this area and that, right? A lot of production out here, a lot of residential area. And, and the university is a large employer. And so, and a lot of students go here too. So those two trip types, um, education and work, there's, this is a big attractor, right? 
Whereas this zone over here is also residential. It's probably not a very big attractor for anybody from here. Whereas the university area is probably a big attraction, right? So this is how we're looking at it. And then we look at what's the, what's the impedance between this big zone here and down here. How long does it normally take? What modes are available? Well, there's not very many modes. Uh, it's mostly driving, right? Especially just sparse out here. The bus doesn't go out here. So your, your, uh, Impedance is probably going to be mostly all travel time. It would be a direct correlation uh, for that, right? The costs of operating the vehicle are directly related to travel time, probably, uh, through there, assuming you're moving at a standard rate uh, through that. Whereas going from zone one to this zone over here, right, that the impedance factor there is very low because you're even closer and you don't have to go through town. Whereas out here going to the university, maybe you drop down to 30, maybe you go through town on, on um, Lincoln Way. So that's, those are the trade-offs, right? And actually we'll talk about a route assignment later, but there's a general cost uh, a friction factor and impedance factor between one zone and another. And that's what, that's what we're looking at. All right, how easy is it to get from one zone to the next through there? And then um, once we know that, and this is more the traditional model using, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, and using gravity, then we can calculate uh, what the cost of these trips are. But it also works with LOGIT, right? So we, the two big distribution systems we use are the, are the LOGIT model and the gravity model. And the LOGIT's newer, and it's, it's caught on uh, about the last 10 years, maybe 15 years. It's, it's become you know, popular, at least it's, there's a lot of research generated about it. Whether it's really doing a better job, I'm not sure. I'm not, like say, uh, travel demand modeling is um, not something I do research in, but Logit has, uh, you hear it all the time now, and so a lot of people are, are talking about it. That doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It just means it's, it's hot right now. Um, the gravity model is the old way of doing it, which is kind of cool. I like the gravity model, just the, the general th uh, theory behind it, which I think will make some sense to you. No, they both do. So we're going to walk through them now uh, one at a time. So this Logit is, um, is saying that each choice you make, it doesn't matter what choices you're, you're talking about, every choice you make has a utility. Um, if, you're, if you're taking economics classes, you know, they like to talk about utility a lot. Um, what's the benefit to you? What's the utility to you as a user, or in this case, us as the traveling public who need uh, consumers of travel, maybe you'd say, what's our utility of going from one zone to another? And maybe it's... Um, uh, choice in food, you know, what's the utility of eating um, stir fry and rice versus a hamburger versus, you know, Taco Bell or something like that, right? Okay, Taco Bell has a lot of taste, but it's probably not good for you. Well, some of the stuff is. Remember, it's beefy um, Frito burritos. It's not a beef Frito burrito. It's beefy. It's, we, just, we don't really know what that means. So, so that's maybe a negative utility there, right? Well, but it tastes good. So that's a positive, right? And so you'll see, and we'll second here, the formulation, you know, you'll have um, multiple factors that go into that utility calculation, right? And, and define the overall utility, right? I know that, that the um, uh, stir fry from the all natural food place is better for me. And so that's a positive on utility, but maybe it's a little more expensive too. So that's a little bit of a negative, right? And so you, you combine these factors together and that gives you an overall utility, right? So Taco Bell's dirt cheap, but probably will make you fat, right? And, and may not be very healthy. So the, uh, so there's, there's some utility function in there, right? Well, I'd say in, in, in my world, the utility of Taco Bell tends to win out over other things, but that's just me, right? It's on the way home. Okay. Um, so the logit model, in it, it can do a better job if you've got good data. Everything comes down to good data, though, even with, no matter what model you're running, right? It, it is a harder, it is a harder uh, distribution system to formulate. It's harder to get the, the a good utility number for it. Um, and this is out of a uh, travel demand modeling guidebook uh, is what said that. So don't take my word for it. I got it from the NCHRP report that, that said that. All right. So the, the logit model, this is the basic, uh, it, the textbook goes through a little bit more background, but it comes down to this, right? Um, you're raising everything to this, um, E, right, 2.7, whatever, you're raising everything, uh, it's E to some power. This power is the utility of that choice you chose, right? Here's the utility of Taco Bell over the utility of Wendy's, Taco Bell, and 
uh, the Asian fusion place, right, with all natural food. All right, so if I were to add the utilities, the E to the utility of each one of those in the, in the denominator, in my denominator, it's just the, the individual utility. And that's the probability that someone's going to make that choice is that. So the probability of IM is the utility of I sub M um, raised you know, as the power of E divided by E to all the other utilities of every other option you've got, right? So maybe you've got four options or five options. You'd have four or five terms down here being added together, right? So that's your utility of all choices, like coming down there. So the uh, I think the way the textbook starts it off, maybe it's a little scarier or <laughs> going into some you know math terminology and, and stuff, maybe a little more than than we're used to. It boils down to this. This is the basic logit. And um, gratefully, they didn't go through the entire derivation of how we end up with, with a logit. Even they skipped forward and said, here's a paper. You can read more about it if you want. So I will tell you, and this uh, logit is, like I say, um, fairly common in transportation, right? It's it's a good system. We use it in, in uh, trip di distribution like that. We also can use it in, in other uh, determinations, I use it for a safety factor uh, issue once. And so it's, it's an interesting formulation, right? And you can, and it's a more common statistical uh, system now, nowadays, and you read more and more about it on the logit model right, through there. So in this case, we're calculating the probability that you're gonna choose um, going from uh, one zone to another by a certain mode. So again, the book is combining the mode with it. So you can say, what's my my probability of going to a destination? Or what's my probability of going to zone three with a bicycle? Or what's my probability of riding a bike? You can use it for mode choice. You can use it for distribution. You can use it for a combination. And again, the book tried to formulate theirs as a combination. All right, so your choice uh, through that. It can be used for... Uh, all three of those options, all right, through there. How do we how do we know what people figure their utility is? Well, we ask them and we do surveys and we and we track people best we can, right? We say, well, we knew you had these choices. We asked you why you chose that. Why did I choose to ride the train to Chicago, right? I hate to find parking and it's it's the stress of looking for parking and not knowing where I'm at and, and turning down the wrong road, whatever, in, in the loop is scary to me, right? I'd rather uh, leave my car at South Shore and ride the train. Plus, I like trains. And I get to read a book. So there's some utility, right? I can do something else instead of just driving. So you ask people these questions, right? You ask a bunch of people from Valpo who work in the loop. Um, how did you get there? What uh, what what mode in uh, are you taking to get to this one zone through there? And then you might even ask them uh, how they how to differentiate the modes and why they chose what they did, right? The train doesn't run the time I want to go. So I don't want to wait around for an extra hour, you know, when I want to come home. So I'm going to drive, right? So that would be part of that, that survey kind of information. And so the way we, this is um, an example I, I pulled out of the book. They're using it as um, some uh, uniform. This is a, theirs was an example using combined mode and, and zone. I'm going to make it even simpler and just say, we're just going to use this for trip distribution, right? That's what we're talking about today. We're just using this for trip distribution. Here's some factor, right, through there, right? I like trains and I don't like to park. So here's my 2.2 factor. That's good, right? Um, okay, the cost of the train, that's got a, a negative 0.2 factor on it. And then the time I'm in the train, that's a, another negative factor, right? If I drive, I don't really like, you know, the stress factor in, in having to drive my own vehicle. There's that. I have some cost of the vehicle here some time, right? I don't know what my other choice here would be. Um, but you can, you know, whatever it is, you, once you get this formulation, now you're calculating your utility. Now, this whole logit hinges on the fact that you can define some utility function for what people are trying to do, right? Whether it's going between zones, which is, which zones. So if I'm doing shopping trips, right? So I want to shop in zone two. Okay, well, it's got better stores, but there's some cost and time. Zone three doesn't have as many good stores. So there's, it's got a lower factor to start with. There's cost and, and time. Zone four has almost nothing. And so it's all pain, you know, that's another way to look at it. If we were just doing from one zone to another. Other. Right. So uh, the, the Achilles heel, I think, on, on the logit is how well can you formulate these utility functions? Right. And, and really, we've, we've talked about it at the start. Travel demand modeling is not an exact science in any way. So they all have issues, right? They each All these systems have issues. 
Um, if you can define these utility functions well, then Logit works pretty good. All right, so if we plug these in, as we were, the number is given from the book. Uh, through there for maybe six dollars for travel time uh, cost it took me 20 minutes and so you know, here's my overall utility function all right for that if we're going from uh, you know choice one to choice two zone one to zone two um, or going to downtown the loop via train versus downtown loop via driving versus downtown at the loop um, uh, on the bus all right so maybe that's all my However you want to formulate whatever your choice is, it doesn't matter in, in the logit model as long as you can define what the utility of that choice is. And here's all. I only have three choices, right? So my denominator is just going to be the sum of all of those. And we'll plug those in, right? So now this is the individual utility of each uh, each trip, right? And what's the what's my probability of, of choosing uh, one of those trips? All right, so it's here's my probability. This was from here, right, at 0.4. I'm going to drop that in here in my uh, <coughs> race to the power e to the 0.4. The sum of all my, my these others, right, 0.4, negative 0.4, negative 0.45, I just drop those in. All right, the, I end up with the, the probability I'm going to choose choice one is, is 0.533. Right. I can plug that in for all the rest of them. So here's my other probabilities, right? And if we did this right, these would better add up to be one. <laughs> or we did. <laughs> well, let's hope we did it right, okay? Um, and then this is probability, right? This probability, I'm going to use this this choice. I'm going to make, here's the probability of this choice. Here's the probability of this choice. Maybe it's going from zone one to two, going from zone one to three, and going from zone one to four for shopping. All right, that was one of the options, all right? If I knew, if I know I that there were a total of 4,000 shopping trips that are going to be generated in zone one. Now I just multiply those probabilities times 4,000. Here's the expected number of trips that uh, each person is going to use. So coming out of zone one, going to zone two, in this case, where we get you know 2,100 and some, uh, trips zone one to three is 956, zone one to four, 912. Right? So that's that's an example of how to use Logit for trip distribution. And this is what we want. We wanted to know how many trips total, you know, are, are, are we expecting. All right now we know if you're going from zone one to three, there's 956 people. The next questions are going to be what mode are you using and what road are you going to use? If you're going to use a car, what road would you use? If you're going to walk, which sidewalks, which, again, which streets might you use for that? If you're going to ride the bus, which bus route, right? So that's that would be the next steps. The first step is how many people are going from, from one thing to another, right? So this is it. That's our trip distribution using the Logit. All right, the other main type of trip distribution models is gravity, and this is the classic one. And it's the most commonly used one, right? And it's been around, been around a while, uh, and been refined, and they keep using it. So it couldn't have been all bad, <laughs> right? So we, we uh, yeah, I guess it's uh, survived the test of time to a degree, right? And and what gravity is going to do, one thing is, is it in within your entire model, it's going to balance the number of productions with the number of attractions, right? And yes, there are some external trips coming into your, your regional model and going out of your regional model, but exclusive of those, you know, you, you can't have more people arriving in a zone than were produced. Um, our, the total number of productions can't be greater than the total number of attractions and vice versa, right? If you've, if you've only got 4,000 trips, you can't have, you know, uh, whoops, this number, right? These can't add up to be 5,000, right? Okay, we only had 4,000 trips being generated. You can't have 5,000 suddenly coming out of that zone, right? Going somewhere else. Uh, through there. So they have to balance it. So let's keep that in mind. This is, we're going to balance these things together. We we go back to these impedance factors. This is where we're going to use it. it was in this gravity model uh, through there. And uh, the utility function kind of, uh, it's in the logit model, it's built into the utility functions, what these impedance factors are. In the in the gravity model, the, the impedance factor is a little more dis, uh, on its own. You can see it. <laughs> How's that? And we calculate it independently for each zone pair, right? All four there. So that's, uh, and it, we've got a, usually a table showing what those impedance factors are uh, through that. And we'll see how to use that in a minute uh, through there. And then we use the, the gravity. We actually use um, a formulation that looks a lot like uh, the equation for the gravity, uh, gravitational pull between two bodies in space. All right. And I'm sure you all remember that from physics. 
but uh, <laughs> we'll talk about it in a second, right? Doesn't it look like this? Oh, it showed up over there, right? It looks like this. So the, the force between two bodies um, is equal to some constant times the mass of the first one times the mass of the second one divided by the distance squared uh, between those two masses. All right, and so the how big each one is, right? The mass of each body makes a difference in the force of attraction between those, between the two bodies, and how far apart the bodies are is also um, they got to make a difference in in the force of attraction, right? If you if you double the distance between, like say, the Earth and the Moon, the the gravitational pull between them would be one fourth, right? What it is now. If you double the mass of the Earth, the gravitational force between the Earth and the Moon would be double. Right. So how big something is and how far apart it is makes a big difference. Uh, those are the fact, main factors in how much force there is between the bodies. Okay. All right. I got my uh, animations backwards. Okay. So <laughs> this is the equation, a uh, generalized equation we use in our trip distribution based off the gravity model. All right through that, and <clears throat> what we're saying is the number of trips between um, a zone I to going to zone J, so maybe it's from zone one to zone three and so forth, is equal to the total number of productions in that zone times the attractions in the other zone. So the, the total number of productions in zone one going to the attractions in zone two, right? If we're looking for trips between zone one and two, times some friction factor, which is impedance, um, divided by the sum of all the attractions and times all of the friction factors in all the other zone pairs, going from one to two, going one from one to three, going from one to four, and so forth. So the I is always the same. It's always whatever zone you're initially looking from, right, through there. So, and and you can look at P times A, production times attractions, is like M1 times M2, right? And we're a little bit different down here. So we, we're dividing by all of the attractions times some friction factor. These friction factors come into play in that they are like the distance. They are similar to like uh, the distance uh, between uh, between these two bodies if we were looking to gravity model, right? So this friction factor, and a lot of times it is distance, is, is a major component of what that friction factor is. But it's it's the difficulty going between those zones, and it, and it kind of is similar to the distance uh, uh, factor in the in the traditional gravity equation, right, through there, right? So the what it boils down to, the gravity model says, right, um, for a given zone with so many productions and another zone with so many attractions, right? If, if it's farther away, fewer people are going to go there. If it's closer, it's more likely people are going to make that trip, right? If it's a shopping trip, yeah, okay, Merrillville has good shopping. I'm less likely I'm going to drive to Merrillville to go to the big mall there when I can go to Valpo and buy what I need, right? And occasionally I will, but usually I'll stay in Valpo. Right, if I'm going to go shopping. All right, so the, the distance is an issue. That's a friction factor. Right, that's a big friction factor in this. All right, but the, um, what's the name of that big mall? South something in uh, Merrillville. It has a lot more shops, right? So its mass is much bigger. So I'm, yeah, that makes me more want to go there. But the distance is so far. Oh, I'm dividing it by distance squared. That's why I don't really want to go that far. Right through there. And maybe this is the number of productions, right? And so if you're looking at everybody who comes to that mall in, in Merrillville, right, it's more likely that, that places that are close and that have a lot of residential, those residents are the ones who are going to make the trip to that mall. So that's another way to look at how this formulation works, right? Does that kind of make sense? All right, so it's saying that um, uh, something with a lot of attractions, some big, uh, uh, you know, could be shopping center, could be, you know, lots of restaurants or something like that. S something, a big attractor is going to have more trips coming to it. And more of those trips are going to be coming from places close to it. And more of those trips are going to be coming from areas that have a large population, have a large number of productions. All right. There that. All right. Maybe I'm being this uh, dead, oh, dead horse here. So this is what it looks like if we go through the gravity model. And, and we're going to skip a lot of the formulation of this. If you want to know more, there's an elective class we teach. Uh, in your, probably your senior year you can take. And you'll get to go through these calculations on your own. 
right, productions and attractions. We're saying we only have three zones. I just made up three zones here in Valparaiso, right? And I'm saying, well, here's the number of productions for whatever type of trip it is. Uh, maybe it's shopping, maybe it's work, right? Here's productions. Here's uh, productions from zone two. Here is productions in zone three. Right. And and maybe maybe it is shopping trips. I don't know. And we're saying that people are going to go shopping in zone one. Right. Um, this is the total number of productions. Oops, sorry. This is productions. This is attractions. There's there's only 561. Uh, maybe it's work trips. Right. Jobs in this zone. There's 1,087 jobs in zone two. That's a, an attraction. Right. And there's uh, 2,004. Um, attractions or jobs in zone three. And so zone one has the biggest population and zone three has uh, the biggest attraction right through there, but it's further away. It's farther away than two. Two is very close, right? And so you, you keep iterating through this. We're within 5% of convergence. And that's exactly, this is after nine iterations. We came within, uh, uh, 5% of convergence on that. Then this is how the big computer models do it. They just, they'll do a thousand iterations until they get convergence on these. What we're doing is we're balancing total number of productions with total number of attractions. All right, remember, um, it's a conservation of, of numbers right here. 3652, there's 3652. The total number of productions has to equal total number of attractions. Right now it's slightly off because I'm even off by about 5% down here in this third row. We could iterate more until we got closer, if we wanted to. And then we'd finally balance all this out right, through that. And that's this is using the gravity model. That's how we would work through the gravity model. Um, don't get hung up on exactly how this table works. Right? Again, that's, uh, that's another class. Right? We'd spend a lot more time in it. The point is, we're balancing productions and attractions. Um, a place with a lot of productions will have more trips going to a place with a lot of attractions, like three. Now here, one to three, um, it balanced by how hard it is to get there, the friction factor or the impedance factor. And so two is actually easier to get to, and there's still, you know, a lot of people there. Um, but we're, you know, fewer, we're making fewer trips from here to there than we are to zone three, even though three has more attractions total in it, just because it's easier to get to two, right? And you can do inner you can do inner zone trips too. We, we so you live and work maybe if you're doing work trips in the zone one you can you can combine them and have them both together. Right. So that's that's trip distribution. Those are our two main ways to do it: uh, the logit model and then the gravity model. Again, gravity is the more common one right now. Logit's got a little more flair to it and uh, a little more popular with the the new formulations through it. Um, you have to know your utility functions well if you're going to use the logit model for the gravity model calculating these this impedance and friction thing um, is important but also knowing your productions and attractions which is easier to figure out right? the productions is right because we know where people live <laughs> it sounds like a line from a movie we know where you live um, we know where people live much better than we know where they work and and where they may want to shop. Now we can kind of estimate total square footage of shopping and so forth. For a shopping trip where people work, it's harder to figure that out through there. But we know production is the best. So actually productions, we have a more accurate number on productions than we do anything else. And that's that's where you can go wrong with the gravity if you have a if you uh, if your attraction numbers are way off, right? You're going to you're going to mess up your model. So that's that's the Achilles heel of the gravity model. Uh, one of them uh, through that. All right, next time we will finish up on uh, travel demand modeling.